uh, a Magnix um, Aerotech project who have electrified a Cessna 208. And then we've got our projects in the UK that I will be talking about rather more. Uh, the Electric Cub and the Electric Sky Ranger under Project Enabel, which stands for Enabling Aircraft Electrification and is a project specifically designed to learn the fundamental lessons of how to realise and deliver certified electric aircraft. So that's a little bit of history today. Let's have a look at a little bit of technology. What does an electric powertrain need to look like? Well, we've got a bunch of components um, that are all new things to put into an aeroplane. So if we start on the right, um, we'll have one or more battery packs. And my maths says the optimal number of battery packs is three. Um, in practice, I've seen anything from one to uh, five in various aircraft, uh, depending upon design decisions they had to make. Those will be DC batteries, obviously, um, pushing out into probably through some kind of combining bus into a combined inverter controller. And what that's doing is it's taking the DC output of your batteries and it's turning it into three phase AC. And generally what happens is if they, the inverter will leave the voltage alone. So whatever it gets out of the battery is what it puts out, but it turns the DC into a variable frequency three phase AC, um, which then feeds into an AC motor. And then the motor um, will obviously turn that into torque and rotational speed, and then that will drive a propeller. Additionally to that, we need a control system. Um, in simplistic terms, it's a throttle, but it's basically going to be a poten potentiometer telling the uh, inverter how much power it wants. And we also will need some instrumentation and we will also need, um, and this is very critical, a cooling system or potentially up to three cooling systems because you've got three major areas of heat generation here, the batteries, the inverter, and the motor. And those need to each be considered separately as a cooling problem. And I've had a good chance to look at multiple projects and it'd be fair to say that no two of them use this, have hit the same problems and the same solutions with system cooling. Um, but I will say it's probably the single biggest headache every project has had is identifying the cooling needs and ensuring adequate cooling. So this is the project I've been working on and the first of two aircraft. So Enabel is a collaboration of Cranfield University, TLAC, which is the light aircraft company based at Little Snoring in Norfolk, Flylight Air Sports, who are based at Northampton Sywell Aerodrome, and a battery technology company called CDO Squared, who are based in Sussex. And we set out, we obtained uh, government funding to build two aircraft. Uh, this is the first and smaller of them. This is a modified Sherwood Cub, which is a British single seat tailwheel aircraft. Um, and as you can see, with a very non-conventional power plant and a very non-conventional instrument panel. Uh, now, we started down this journey around um, the beginning of last year um, with our funding and we started on the build and by about Christmas of last year we got to the point of something that looked faintly aeroplane shaped and we were capable of running it on the ground which was where we started to learn a lot about how to deliver on an electric powertrain in terms of the cooling, in terms of the system control, in terms of the system efficiency, and one of the important things about the noise. Now, you may fondly 
think that like electric cars, electric aeroplanes are going to be virtually silent. This is a lovely idea, turns out not to be true. Um, the reason is really simple, which is that on any aeroplane with a propeller, around 80% of all of your noise comes from the propeller. And so I will just show you a little bit of a ground test from before we did the first flight on the Cub and we'll get this message across. That's enough of that, but that's just getting that key message across that although electric aircraft are quieter, they're not that much quieter. Also, in the middle of winter, in the middle of Norfolk, yes, I was every bit as cold as I look in that piece of video. So, um, let's just talk technology for a moment before we carry on talking about the Annabelle program. Um, we've got roughly speaking five solutions available to us for a electric flight project. Uh, batteries, 14-ish times heavier in use. So really this is only going to work for sports and training aeroplanes. You are not going to be going on your, even, even on a business trip to Paris, let alone on your holidays to the Maldives in a battery electric aeroplane because it's just not going to carry any payload. Um, but for, I mean, the Cub there, um, I'll show you some results later, but this will fly for around an hour and a quarter. Um, the Velis Electro will give you around 45 minutes. The bigger aircraft we're building, the, the Sky Ranger will probably give around 90 minutes. So it is feasible for a training aeroplane. It is feasible for a recreational aeroplane. It is certainly not feasible for most forms of transport. Hydrogen looks really promising. Um, it will need new airframe shapes simply because it's about four times the volume of the equivalent amount of kerosene. Um, we will need to develop whole new ways of um, storing and transporting it because you've got hydrogen embrittlement. You've obviously got all of this need to um protect against risk of explosion um we on the other hand it's very light even if it's bulky so we may well be able to tanker uh, for long range flights in ways we can't currently do um but we are still on a upwards journey as a community to learn how to deliver on that um promise Liquid hydrogen. Now, when I was an undergraduate, uh, we learned from a seminal book called uh, The Anatomy of the Aeroplane by Daryl Stinton. And I'm sure many of you here have read that book as well. And it told us that when it was written in 1966, that the future was cryogenic hydrogen. Well, we're now in 2022 and some people are still saying the future is cryogenic hydrogen. The bad news is it is already the future and it turned out that was run true. The fundamental reason being the sheer amount of energy that is needed to keep your hydrogen cold. And that pretty much cripples it as a viable technology, at least with anything we've got at the moment. So I do not myself think liquid hydrogen um, which needs to be cooled down to about 33 Kelvin, still needs to be stored at three bar or above, 
and then needs a very heavy and energy consuming cooling system is the future, in my opinion. Ammonia, um, I could introduce you to a, an eminent scholar who says that ammonia is the fuel of the future. I can introduce you to another eminent scholar who will say it is a completely pointless dead end and has no future. Um, as a researcher, that clearly says to me there's research to be done. Um, so on paper, ammonia looks really interesting. Um, you can use it in fuel cells for electric aircraft. It could also incidentally be put into gas turbine or IC engines. Um, it sits sort of between lithium batteries and kerosene in density, so it's just good enough. Um, it's incredibly fire safe. It's really, really hard to get it to catch fire. The downside is it's also incredibly toxic. So if you crash an aircraft full of ammonia, you are unlikely to burn to death, but you may suffocate. This may not be a win, um, but I certainly, in my opinion, ammonia is a very valid possible solution to future airborne energy problems because ammonia's, ammonia is an H3. It has nitrogen and hydrogen in it. Put it over a catalyst, dump the nitrogen over the side. We don't need that. Put the hydrogen through whatever type of powertrain I want. But nothing in that is really at all significantly polluting. Doesn't it's not going to impact on climate change. It's probably not going to impact on anybody who breathes it in. Um, and as I said, its energy density looks quite promising. Fundamental problem with ammonia, we just haven't done enough research yet. So I would say watch this space. Um, there is, a, I think, Norwegian ship that has been sailing the seas on ammonia for several years now to prove the point. Um, so it's certainly proved you can run a powertrain on ammonia, but no, we do not yet know how to do an ammonia powertrain on an aircraft, but we'd like to. And if it proves to be a stupid idea, at least we prove it from a position of knowledge. Um, and hybridization, um, the combination most likely of battery electric with any one of the above. That does look promising. Um, certainly that's been shown to work really well by Volterra in France. And I, I mean, I am working with Volterra, but they're by no means the only people in that space. And I do think that has a lot of potential. Important message though here, we don't know what the winners is, win is going to be. I do not know what is going to be winning the technology race in 10 or in 20 years time, um, which is really exciting. I like not knowing what the future is going to be look like and then working on trying to create that future or at least solve some of the problems needed by the people who will try and do that. Um, if we are going to go forward, and this is a big part of what we're doing with Annabelle. Um, we need new safety standards. There's a whole bunch of stuff we do not know how to do safely enough, well enough yet. Um, we've got over a century of experience of certifying our aeroplanes with conventional powertrains, and there has been one certified electric aircraft, and that was very much still just beyond the prototype stage. Um, things that I'm routinely having meetings about, um, how to certify battery packs. What do our fail safe requirements look like for the electrics? Um, here's a fun one. Um, you take an electric motor, bring your power back to zero, it stops. Then generally speaking, certainly with a big one, the current demand to unstick it to get it rotating again means that it takes quite a significant number of seconds to start rotating. And for from an aviation safety viewpoint where say I want instantaneous power uh, for a uh, go around, that's unacceptable. So we've put in our working standards that you've got to have idle to full power in three seconds. 
other people make for each other solutions there's technology solutions to this it's one of the things we need to look at uh, battery charging systems uh, yes there's a lot of car technology there but we don't really know if this is going to map to aeroplanes um, thermal control big big problem for every project i know of um, pilots have got to have adequate understanding of control and they've got to have adequate information about what they're flying and that's just for the simple battery electric i'm flying at the moment add in other fuels and you've got containment you've got how to measure how much i've got we know how to measure how much is in a tank of kerosene how do i accurately measure what's in a tank of hydrogen how do i accurately measure what's in a tank of um, ammonia and also the crashworthiness of all of these systems hybridize it and we also need to solve a bunch of problems on um, how to switch between the different powertrains if anybody reads the aaib report on the crash of the high flyer one zero avias aircraft you will learn a lot about why that really matters however and i why i'm i am an enthusiast for hybridization let me give you an example of how it could work really really well and and just throw that may help this work the concept is still working yep i need two types of energy on my aircraft i need my mission energy or fuel and i need my safety reserves and for a shorter trip actually the safety reserves are more than my mission fuel and i do not need my my safety reserves to be particularly non-polluting because i'm not actually expecting to use them very often so let's pick a route the one i like is jersey to guernsey 24 nautical miles typical small commuter airplane will take you about 15 minutes um, so i need to carry 15 minutes of mission fuel but my safety reserves require me to be able to go around divert somewhere else which is probably 30 minutes away in france plus 30 to 45 minutes of additional reserves so i'm carrying probably an hour and a half's worth of fuel for a 15 minute flight and there's nothing to stop me if i've got a suitable hybrid system carrying my 15 minutes mission flight energy in battery and my hour and a quarter of safety reserves can all just sit there in a tank um, knowing it's bad for the environment but actually not caring very much because i'll probably only ever touch that once a year so hybridization may well be the fudge we're looking for another technology and i like this as a thought experiment is metal air batteries so what's a metal air battery it's basically a one-shot fuel cell so it's a plate of something like aluminium or iron that you force air through heat up and in oxidizing the metal it creates electricity and you can have an energy density around 10 times better than the current best lithium batteries at least in the lab um, and what a wonderful idea that is except a you can only use it once so it may well work as a sort of electrical auxiliary power unit it may well work for your reserve energy but you to have to take this off and scrap it or rework it every time you fly is clearly a bit problematic um, and also your aluminium oxide or your iron oxide will be significantly heavier the best bare metal was before you started using it as a battery so congratulations you've just invented the world's first airplane that's heavier at landing than at takeoff um, which clearly presents some mild technical difficulties to overcome um, additionally what about all the ground support infrastructure 
If I'm going to electrically charge aeroplanes at every airport, I'm going to need a massive new power grid that doesn't currently exist. Um, the, the national grid in Britain and the equivalent grids in most other countries are creaking at the seams already uh, because they're basically Victorian designs upgraded to the best of the abilities of cash strapped energy companies um, who have got limited development budgets and are usually against all sorts of planning constraints every time they try and improve things. So we would need to massively upscale all of our power grids. And if we're going into other fuels, we would need whole new distribution systems for that as well. Um, if we're storing new fuels, hydrogen, ammonia, whatever at airports, we need to learn how to do that as well. And by the way, everything else we use, if we, there's no point in having a lovely efficient electric aeroplane if I then keep it going on the ground with a smelly, noisy, polluting diesel, diesel um, ground power unit. Um, now, it's a bit of film here, if it will play. I filmed just over the fence at Farnborough Air Show this year. Uh, it's obviously a, an A400M. And this was the air conditioning unit that was needed to keep it cool inside in Farnborough in July. and trust me could smell the diesel fumes as well so it's a really clear indication of this need to think far beyond the flight vehicle fire and rescue all of these new fuels all of these new energy sources if we're going to start flying these around the world's airports then all of the world's airports fire and rescue crews need training in how to deal with them um every airport you fly a new technology aircraft needs a retrained fire section civil fire services well sooner or later you're going to crash one in a field next to a town they're going to need to know how to deal with as well the basic airport infrastructure is still essentially 1950s so we've got to rethink all of that now i'm not saying we shouldn't be doing all of this what I am advocating is don't stop your thinking at the flight vehicle. We need to think about all of this that sits behind it to be able to make these future technologies work. Just designing the aeroplane will not be enough. Um, and a lot of it come down to people. Now, I love this photograph. It's not mine. I nicked it off the website of RF Prize Norton. Um, they took it um, to illustrate all of the different trades that are involved in getting the UK's VIP Airbus airborne. And you can see we've got soldiers, we've got pilots, we've got caterers, we've got administrators, you name it. Um, and as far as I can tell, there will be some aspect of the job of every one of those, with the exception of the padre and the chef which will need to be changed by different fuels going onto aircraft. So I'm just showing the, the scale of this. Um, I will come back to actually talking about the Enabel project in a bit, but I'm also going to point out that we're not going to solve all of this in one go. Um, I've got a colleague, a guy called um, Professor Perry Polides at Cranfield who's come up with this great concept of technology waves. And he thinks that we need to be thinking in the future, not in terms of here is the solution that will solve everything next year or in five years, but OK, stage one now, stage two in 10 years, stage three in 15 years, stage four in 30 years, whatever is that time scale, and we need to be planning in those terms. And if you look at it historically, that's how it's worked out. Um, 1960, Hawker P1127, the aircraft that turned into the Harrier, made its first flight. 30 years later, the F-22 made its first flight. 30 years later, the world got its first certified all-electric aeroplane. That's the level of development. And despite the fact those three aircraft are sort of vaguely the same size and shape, 
in reality, though, that's what technology waves look like. And we need to be thinking in terms of future waves of technology, not here is the big the, the big step that will solve all of our problems, because I don't think that's going to happen. Now, let's come back to my project again. Um, so 21st of April this year, I had the enormous privilege of being the pilot to make the first flight on Britain's first British designed and built, because I'm not counting Rolls Royce because they bought an American kit plane, um, all electric aircraft. And I'm going to show you the first flight video. So that was April. Um, since then, we've flown 14 flights in the aircraft, or I have flown, nobody else has flown this aircraft yet. Um, just under 10 total flying hours. Um, at the moment, the flight testing is on hold, um, has been since uh, the end of June. The reason being the cooling problems I've mentioned, and I'll illustrate why these uh problems exist so this is a climb performance curve that i measured 
doing full throttle climb just after takeoff on the airplane. Um, this is density altitude, so you can actually assume that's actually about the ground. It was on a hot day. Um, and these are the temperatures of the motor. So start off, I've got a 40 Celsius motor and I'm climbing with full power, 28 kilowatts at 300 feet a minute. Um, about one and a half minutes later, that temperature has climbed to 80 Celsius. And at that point, my power starts to drop off. And by three minutes, I'm up to 85 Celsius and my power is down to 19 kilowatts, which is only giving me 200 feet a minute. And then another two and a half minutes later, it's up to 90 Celsius, which is getting towards the point where I really need to reduce power engine. And I'm down to 15 kilowatts of generated power at full throttle and 50 feet per minute. And this has ceased to be a particularly useful aeroplane. This is the problem we're trying to solve at the moment. And the issue is relatively straightforward. It's the solution that is not. So I've got a 28 kilowatt motor. It's very light. It's about eight kilos, mostly of aluminium alloy. Um, it's probably around 90% efficient. So I'm generating about 2.8 kilowatts of heat. 2.8 kilowatts of heat into eight kilos of aluminium. Strange enough, it warms up quite fast. And what's happening is as it's warming everything, particularly the coils, is the ability of the system to translate electrical power into um, torque, degrades and I'm getting less and less available power out of the system. Um, it's not becoming less efficient insofar as I don't believe that my efficiency is going down much below about 90%. The problem is its ability to actually generate power in this thrust at all is degrading. So what are they doing? We have been working hard on this over the last three months is um, I think we're on about our fourth redesign of the cooling system. Lots of stuff that we've been tweaking. Ground test. I think we're there. Hopefully, I shall be up a little snoring. Uh, ground test, what we believe is our next flight system next week. And then around a week later, hopefully flying it again, assuming that next week's ground tests show satisfactory performance in the cooling. Everything else is fine. Yes, there have been a whole bunch of issues to solve. Throttle control, instrumentation, um, interference with the radio, interference with the compass. All of this is there, but this has been the showstopper problem. And if you talk to just about anybody else in this space, any country, any project, they've all been up against exactly the same problem. Nobody has really learned what best practice is in cooling the propulsion system of an electric aircraft yet. Save probably possibly Pipistrelle and they ain't talking. So where are we going next? So hopefully next week I'll do a successful ground test of the new cooling system. Hopefully the following week I will then start to flight test that. It'll probably take me a couple of days to shake down the new cooling system. And then we're into, now we've, we've already established the basic handling, the function of the instrumentation. Um, we haven't established the performance of the aeroplane because with all of these cooling problems, we've not been able to fly it enough at high enough a power to start establishing performance. We've got a fairly good idea about range and endurance. We've got a less good idea about takeoff and climb. So the next phase is going to be performance testing. Um, some initial basic takeoff distance, etc. And then we've reached a milestone of a basically acceptable aircraft with known good flying characteristics. But knowing they're good does not necessarily mean we know them well. So the next phase, which is our phase three, so phase zero was first flight, phase one was basic system function, phase two was advanced system function, which we've interrupted. Then phase three, we're 
going to produce a complete performance manual for this airplane in the manner that would be done for a small airliner. Now, clearly an aircraft like this does not require that legally. That's not the point. The po point is we want to learn how to do this so we can share this knowledge and establish the benchmark for the whole world's community going forward. Um, that will be a very major and important piece of research. This will all be put in the public domain, of course. Uh, and then from there, we will start putting more instrumentation on it. That will take us into phase four, which is more research flying. We've also um, done an in principle deal with the Royal Air Force who want to fly it. So they're going to come along and do some of their own research flying in the aircraft as well. Um, and then from that, we should be flying the, our second aircraft. So this aircraft um, is as built as it can be at the moment. Um, it's been tested. Rotation is all in the the gap on the batteries are being manufactured in the UK. Now, a year and a half ago, there was no UK manufacturing capability for large lightweight battery packs. We have created that from scratch as part of this project. And we're all say we're ground testing it at the moment with a prototype battery. It's running fine. We're now in the final build of the four large eight kilowatt hour battery packs that will go in this aircraft. Um, and will hopefully take us to first flight. Honest best guess about the middle of November. Um, we're also hoping as we come to the end of this project to develop that powertrain in to a production powertrain that can be fitted into aircraft for engines similar to the Rotax 912, so around the 80 horsepower bracket. That is sort of the last technical ambition of the Annabelle program. So that's what I've been up to. Lots about the general um, Let's just go back to generalities again. So are electric aircraft the future? Yes and no. Um, as I said earlier, I think that battery electric are only going to be used usable for a small number of narrow niche applications. However, a hydrogen fuel cell aircraft, a hybrid aircraft is still a um, and that shows a lot of potential for longer range, for greater payload, for better efficiency going forward. So I do think electric aircraft are the future, but relatively clear cut 